Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Colleen Holder, and I will be doing the welcome for our climate change expert, Mr. Kumar Singh, Mr. Kishan Kumar Singh, the Honorable Bridget Anisette George, Speaker of the House of Representatives of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, the Vice President of the Senate of Trinidad and Tobago, Senator Nigel De Freitas, Presiding Officers of the Parliaments and the Legislative Assemblies of the Caribbean, Americas, and Atlantic Region of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, the presiding officer of the Tobago House of Assembly Legislature, Dr. Denise Soyafat Angus, clerks of the parliaments and legislative assemblies of the Caribbean, Americas, and the Atlantic region, guests, members of the public of viewing us as well via the parliament's live stream, members of the media, good morning. I would like to welcome you to the lecture on the geopolitical response to climate change by esteemed local climate change expert, Mr. Kishan Kumar Singh. This is part of the 18th Biennial Conference of Presiding Officers and Clerks of the Caribbean, Americas, and Atlantic Region of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. Mr. Kumar Singh comes with a wealth of experience and knowledge to discuss this topic at hand. Academically, he has an MPhil in Chemistry from the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, BSc Honours also from the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. LLB Honours with Environmental and Planning Law and Public International Law from the University of London. Po Postgraduate Training on International Environmental Law, Multilateral Conferences and Negotiations Diplomacy. From 1998 to present, Mr. Kumar Singh has been the lead technical negotiator for Trinidad and Tobago under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. He has co-chaired international negotiations on technology transfer, adaptation, and other issues throughout the period, and he has attended various technical workshops on climate change. As early as 2004, he was the vice chairman, expert group on technology transfer under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. In 2009, he was the climate change advisor to the Environment Minister and Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago for the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Port of Spain and the 15th Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Convention on Climate Change. He's been a member of the Bureau of Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertif Desertification, my apologies. In 2011, he was an expert reviewer for Japan's fifth national communication to the UNFCCC. Mr. Kumar Singh has written many scholarly papers on climate change affecting coral reefs, also affecting the National Bird of Trinidad and Tobago, the Scarlet Ibis, etc. He currently holds the position of overall project manager, low emissions capacity building for Trinidad and Tobago, responsible for the development of nationally appropriate mitigation actions and intended nationally determined contributions in Trinidad and Tobago as evolving obligations under the UNFCCC. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Kishan Kumar Singh. Thank you, Master of Ceremonies, presiding officers and clerks of the parliaments of the ECC region of the CPA. I think I got that right. Um, all other protocols observed, good morning. Um, that was quite a generous introduction, um, I must say. Uh, first, let me thank the CPA for its uh, kind invitation to uh, address you this morning on uh, a topic that is probably um, the single most significant environmental issue facing all countries of the world, and in particular, developing countries, and even more particularly, small island developing states uh, in the 21st century. This is a topic that, I has, that, that has become very close to my heart. Um, I started following climate change as a hobby in my early postgraduate days. Um, because it was quite an interesting issue that transcended environmental uh, core issues and has now pervaded 
uh, all socioeconomic aspects of, of well-being in all countries. The topic I've chosen um, is the Paris Agreement, which is the most recent climate change uh, instrument that has been adopted by, by over 159 countries as of yesterday uh, who have ratified the, the, the agreement. Um, and it uh, actually now sets the way for climate diplomacy uh, in the 21st century. I should warn you, it's very long. My presentation is very long, but I have no intention of speaking on every slide. Um, I just did it for completeness, so that uh, if it's uh, being disseminated, then in your spare time, you can actually look at it and, and have a, a, a good read. So, um, climate change has been recognized as a problem. Why? Uh, because of the emissions of green, what are called greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Uh, greenhouse gases are gases that trap heat in the atmosphere and cause a warming of the planet. And these greenhouse gases have come about as a result of the exploitation of fossil fuels primarily for energy. And as you know, energy drives economies. So energy use and economies and economic development are closely related. Thereby, climate change uh, having been an issue that was core uh, environmental has now been linked to socioeconomic development because of that nexus with energy and its role in economic development. Over time, uh, there has been an increase in atmospheric temperatures, and such increase uh, would have secondary and tertiary impacts. So for example, uh, the warming of, of the Earth's atmosphere will result in a change in the climate, and hence the, the terms global warming and climate change have been used interchangeably, and with climate change being now the more accepted and widely used term. The climate system really dissipates energy in the atmosphere, uh, so that if you have warming, then the dissipation of that energy will result in a change in the climate dynamics, and hence climate change. It, the likely impacts, for example, will include a warming of sea surface temperatures, which will cause an increase in sea levels, which will have adverse impacts on, on low-lying coastal states, uh, small island states in particular. It will have uh, impacts on agriculture because it will increase the aridity of soils and, and, and affect uh, agricultural production. It will have impacts on fruiting times um, and general ecology because ecological processes are closely linked with the climate of an, of, of an area. And, and that, that gives rise to biodiversity issues, for example. So uh, climate change is projected to have um, very serious impacts and threats on sustainable development. And I will deal with that a little bit later, um, but the threat really is unsustainable development, which has long been recognized as an issue. So there's a close nexus between sustainable development and climate change, and that has been sort of underpinned and underscored with the adoption of the uh, sustainable development goals uh, quite recently. Um, being sort of a, a scientist, um, I, I like to think in pictures, so forgive the, the slide, but that shows uh, really what the temperature increase has been um, over the past, um, what is it, from 1800 to the present, and the average global temperature has risen, risen by about 0.99 degrees, uh, almost one degree. And it's, uh, as you can see from the period uh, 1980, the present, uh, the rise has been a, a lot more steeper than, than uh, those before. If you look at that in a, in a global trend, you'll see um, how the, the surface temperatures of the atmosphere have changed. Um, there's a, a, a general warming trend. Um, if you look at sea surface temperatures, the sea surface temperatures have also increased. Those will have impacts on corals, for example, because coral reefs can only exist within a very, very narrow range. Of, of temperature, and that will have a so, sort of secondary impacts on fisheries and, and food production and so on, and as well the associated sea level rise. Um, so the evidence, the scientific evidence is clear um, that the climate is changing, the climate has changed. Um, if you examine some of the local meteorological records of some countries, and in Trinidad in particular, if you look at the uh, records, you'll actually see that the, uh, 
that the temperature has risen, the mean temperature has risen, um, some sea level rise has taken place, and there are changes that are now being documented um, that will sort of record the impacts of climate change. So this has long been uh, recognized as an issue, um, and because it's a global issue, because not one country um, causes climate change, and because it, it's part of the global commons, it has been recognized as an issue that is of global importance to mankind. And therefore, a global problem requires a global response. And therefore, um, the concern was this global warming issue um, and how to act in the face of uncertainty. And what do I mean by that is that the climate does not respond immediately to emissions. It takes about five or six decades. So if the world were to shut down now without any power, without any energy, without a single molecule of greenhouse gas ever being emitted again, we are still going to experience temperature increases and sea level rise and sea surface temperature increases in the future because of emissions of the past, because it takes about five or six decades before the impact of the emissions are actually felt in the atmosphere. How it is going to increase and the actual impacts can only be um, had, or an idea can only be had through modeling, uh, computer modeling, and no one can predict the future. So there is a lot of uncertainty, even with the computer modeling. Even with the computer models, um, the level of uncertainty uh, is significant. That is being sort of decreased as time goes on and the technology increases. But how to act in that face of uncertainty is a critical problem for politicians in particular. Um, and for everyone, because no one likes to act, or no one likes to act uh, particularly in the face of, of uncertainty, because you might end up doing the wrong thing. And I think that's, that's sort of the primary pro problem. One of the concerns also was the unfairness in the distribution of effects um, and costs of the climate change problem. So that emissions started rising in the atmosphere with the advent of the Industrial Revolution which of course was um, sort of set in the developed world in the north. Uh, and so it is widely accepted that there is some historical responsibility for the climate change problem that rests with the developed countries of the north. Um, we see how that has changed as time goes on. And of course, the issue of unsustainable development. So this is a problem that was facing um, world governments. And as far back, as 1979, uh, there was a first World uh, Climate Conference which identified climate change as an urgent problem. And from then, um, we had a series of meetings um, that culminated in the a resolution of the General Assembly of the UN to negotiate a framework agreement um, that will address the problem. And that was as a result of the general acceptance that climate change was an urgent problem of mankind and one of the global commons, affecting the global commons. As a result of, of that, um, the negotiations took place between 1988 or 1990 rather, and 1992 um, that culminated in the uh, formation or the formulation of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the first sort of policy instrument that was signed by world governments that addressed the problem. It was a framework convention, as the name implies, which means that as time goes on, um, and as the science becomes uh, clearer, that, and as the certainty becomes clearer, that more uh, defined actions will be effected uh, as, as, it, as, as time goes on. So it has a, a very long history, and the most recent one, or the most recent ones, would be uh, the, um, the Kyoto Protocol, which you must have heard of, uh, which was adopted in 1997, uh, the Bali Action Plan, the, the Copenhagen Conference, and the Paris Agreement. If I were to just single out four significant events in the, in the, in the recent history of the um, Climate Change Convention. So um, I will just, I wouldn't go through the history of it. You can read that, uh, as I said. But in terms of the, uh, the 
Clearwater Agreement or the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was adopted in 1992 and was open for signature, it came into force in 1994. It, uh, it defines an, an ultimatum objective and principles, um, which also apply to the Kyoto Protocol. And it, it divides countries into maybe two blocks, the North, also called um, Annex One, because they are defined in, the, in an annex of the convention, and the rest are non-Annex One which is really developing countries, but there are small interests that have evolved over time, such as the interests of small island states that um, was uh, articulated through the alliance of small island states, and there's a little anecdote to that, um, and this is a reported speech because I wasn't there, that um, in 1989, after the Minister of Environment of Trinidad and Tobago attended, uh, a special conference on ministers of environment uh, of small island states in the Maldives and after on climate change in particular, around the dinner table, um, he was alarmed by the, by the significant impacts and said um, small islands need to uh, speak with one voice um, and therefore we need some kind of alliance of small island states. And from there, the EOSIS or the alliance of small island states, I understand, was born. So, uh, so interests um, within those larger groupings became uh, more vocal. So you had the, the small island developing states and you had the least developing countries, or the LDCs, as a subset of the non-Annex One countries or the broader developing countries. Um, all parties have general commitments under the convention, including reporting on their emissions and other things. Annex One parties or developed countries um, have an obligation under the convention to provide finance uh, to developing countries for them to uh, implement the obligations under the convention um, and as well technology transfer and the uh, uh, capacity building associated with dealing with climate change. The convention defines uh, certain institutional bodies, uh, the first and foremost being the conference of the parties which is the supreme decision making body of the party and several subsidiary bodies that deal specifically with technological and science, scientific advice uh, and with implementation and supporting other bodies for finance such as the Global Environment Facility um, and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change which was set up by the, the World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environment Program in 1988 to provide advice, scientific advice on climate change. So, the convention meets um, at COPS, conferences of the parties, and the UNFCCC entered into force in 1994, so the first meeting of the conference of the parties was in 1995. Negotiation of the United Nations Framework Convention in the first place um, saw interests being very vocal. Um, so, for example, the, 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 the geopolitical realities of the day played out in a, in a heavy manner. North American countries, or, or countries of the North, the developed countries in particular, but in particular the United States, um, were very um, concerned that any um, agreement that would impose restriction on energy would also have an impact on economic activity because of the nexus of, between energy use and economic development. Some developing countries with interest in, in oil and gas, not Trinidad and Tobago I, as far as I understand, um, also had some uh, concerns. But the eventual agreement did not um, elucidate or did not explicitly assign targets of reduction targets to, 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 to developed countries because of that resistance and that sort of interest. So you had what was uh, a sort of watered down version, uh, but stands today, uh, the Framework Convention. So at the first conference of the parties in 1995, parties agreed that this was a weak agreement, and this was in Berlin in 1995, and therefore they agreed to negotiate a new instrument under the convention that will uh, be applicable to developed country parties because of the recognition of the historical responsibility. Um, and that, the, that instrument was supposed to have been uh, agreed to in two years, but by 1997, and it culminated in Japan in Kyoto. Uh, 
and hence the Kyoto Protocol. The Kyoto Protocol therefore had binding, legally binding targets, a top-down approach uh, for developed countries of 5.2% of the aggregate emissions to be reduced by uh, 2012, what was known as the first commitment period, compared to their 1990 levels. And it consisted of, of the sort of what we call the basket of gases that were the most potent greenhouse gases. So it included carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, hydrofluorocarbons, perfluorocarbons, sulfur hexafluoride, uh, if you permit me to be a little bit technical. Uh, these gases uh, are, are formed um, by natural processes as well as by man-made processes. And the reason that these were included is because of what is called the high global warming potential. Um, so for example, carbon dioxide might be the most abundant. In fact, water vapor is the most abundant and the most potent. But carbon dioxide, uh, being a man-made sort of gas because of fossil fuel com combustion, uh, is, is the least potent of all, but it's the most abundant. So any other gas is compared to carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is given an arbitrary normal, normalized value of one. So for example, nitrous oxide, which is emitted through various industrial processes like nitric acid production, um, over a 100 year time scale, has a global warming potential of about 298 to 300. What does that mean? It means that one molecule of nitrous oxide will cause the same warming as 298 molecules of carbon dioxide over the same period. So these gases were chosen because of the high global warming potential. There were no binding, development, no binding, legally binding targets for developing countries under the Kyoto Protocol, but there were um, obligations under the Kyoto Protocol for developing countries in terms of getting them to uh, have more defined and more accurate invent uh, inventories of their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the Kyoto Protocol was also characterized by by what are called the flexible mechanisms. And of particular concern to developing countries was the clean development mechanism, which meant that a developed country could invest in a developing country um, and in clean technology, for example, and claim the emissions that are reduced against its target. So uh, a developed country could invest, could replace a power generation plant, a coal power generation plant, by let's say natural gas or even renewable uh, uh, power generation. Uh, because coal is a dirty fuel and natural gas is a clean fuel, it will have less uh, emissions. And the difference in emissions would then be claimed by the developed country against its target under the Kyoto Protocol. It's called a clean development mechanism. Needless to say, some countries found it difficult because it was a top-down approach, um, found it difficult to meet their targets uh, I think the European Union was the only bloc that actually met. Um, you would remember in 2000, and 2000 in fact, um, when George W. Bush, uh, President of the United States, came into power, he pulled out of the, the Kyoto Protocol, saying that uh, it was fl fatally flawed, quote unquote, and it was not in the interest of the United States. And so the, 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 the United States was not a party to the Kyoto Protocol. They signed it, but they did not ratify it. And therefore, at that time, the United States account accounting for about 33% of the world's emissions, um, being not a party to an effort, a global effort to reduce emissions and to avert climate change was a serious problem uh, for other countries. So it signaled, for example, very early on that there were going to be huge challenges with achieving the objectives of the Kyoto Protocol. Notwithstanding that, uh, there were targets for individual developed countries to meet. Uh, so if you account for 33%, uh, you, know, you have to 3% of the emissions not being addressed. Uh, so it, therefore, it, it served to be a concern. Uh, fast forward to 2007, um, under the Bali Action Plan, because it's called the Bali Action Plan because the Conference of the Parties at that year, in that year was held in, in Bali. Um, we saw for the first time um, voluntary actions coming from uh, developing countries, the large developing countries. And that was a concern of the United States, for example, in early 1994, uh, early 1992, well, when, the, when, the, when the framework convention was being negotiated, because the argument was that there were large developing countries, the emerging economies, that were accounting for a large amount of greenhouse gas emissions as well. 
um, notably China and India, and that they, were ha they had to do, uh, you know, take action as well. The counter argument from these emerging economies was that they had a right to develop, and therefore development was closely linked to energy, and energy was closely linked to emissions, and therefore they should not have uh, any targets uh, that would serve to be inimical to their interests, to their development interests. And so you had that sort of geopolitical north-south strong divide in, in 1992, which uh, sort of uh, persisted until uh, maybe 2007, where for the first time we saw developing countries um, coming forward to say, okay, they, 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 they will have voluntary actions. Uh, and we heard of nationally appropriate mitigation actions. Now, uh, climate change lingo is not English. Um, it has its own sort of peculiarities. And, um, so that mitigation is not to lessen the effect as it is in plain English. It actually means in climate change context to reduce emissions. Um, and adaptation, of course, is to cope with the adverse impacts of climate change. So um, we saw nationally appropriate mitigation actions coming uh, up in, in Bali. Um, Bali also uh, uh, announced its action plan that uh, defined a two-year period for the negotiation of an outcome uh, in 2009. And that conference was held in, in Copenhagen. Um, Copenhagen account, uh, resulted in a, in a no result. Um, it was called the famous flop um, in terms of climate action. I, I beg to differ. I thought that the Copenhagen Accord uh, was perhaps the, the most important COP and the most important document that arose out of the, out of the, the United Nations uh, climate change process. Um, and it was a flop, in my view, perhaps because the expectations were too high. Um, and the, the North-South divide persisted throughout the, the conference um, with the result that the accord that was agreed to um, was, did not form part of the official record of the meeting, but the, conference, but the parties agreed to just take note. And other parties, all the world then was invited to subscribe to the accord, and most people did. But what it did for the first time, the accord established a, a global fund called the Green Climate Fund, um, setting a, a, a floor rather than a ceiling of $100 billion per year by 2020. Because finance, climate finance is an, is an issue for developing countries. Uh, they need finance to implement, to develop, to address their climate change commitments that they have agreed to uh, under the Climate Change Convention 1 and sort of the instruments that followed. Copenhagen Accord for the first time also blurred the lines between the, the sharp north-south divide that persisted um, prior to 2009 and in all the negotiations that led to 2009. What Copenhagen also did was that it challenged multilateralism as it was known and climate diplomacy as it was, uh, it was accustomed to being addressed to at that time. And in Cancun in the following year, in, in, uh, uh, at COP16, the 16th Conference of the Parties, um, multilateralism again was given a shot in the arm by the agreement of the Cancun agreements, uh, which saw uh, uh, a lot of agreements and decisions being taken that built on the provisions of the Copenhagen Accord. So the Copenhagen Accord, in my view, uh, was a very significant, very, very significant turning point in, in climate diplomacy uh, and in the, in the process. What still persisted was that need for all countries to now uh, recognize that they all have to take action to address the climate change uh, issue. Because by then, uh, China overtook the United States as the, the world's leading emitter of greenhouse gases, the largest polluter. Uh, United States was in second position. And you had India, um, South Korea, South Africa, uh, the basic countries, Mexico, for example, Brazil. Um, who were uh, increasingly uh, becoming recognized for their, their emissions. Um, and therefore, developing countries could no longer 
hide from the fact that they are going to be responsible in the long term and they are going to be uh, held accountable, I suppose, uh, for emissions to the global commons. So in Durban, at the Durban conference in, in, in South Africa, uh, parties agreed to establish an ad hoc working group on the Durban platform for enhanced action and um, agreed that the outcome should be a legally binding instrument or an agreement with legal, an outcome with legal force. Um, it therefore meant that distinct from what was agreed to in Bali for Copenhagen, the outcome defined for Copenhagen was not um, categorized in any way. It could have been a COP decision, it could have been a legally binding instrument, it could have been a new instrument under the convention, and that was one of the sort of uh, uh, ambiguities in the agreement um, in, in Bali to arrive at an agreement in, uh, in, in Copenhagen. Learning from that, it was given more specific contextualization in Durban as to what the outcome of this new process should be. It could have been a legal instrument, a protocol, or an outcome with legal force. So it, it was clear that the outcome should be uh, something that had legally uh, binding uh, force on, 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 on countries. So the ad hoc working group on the Durban platform for enhanced action, also called the EDP, commenced, it work, commenced its work and in 2015 um, agreed on the Paris, we adopted the Paris Agreement in Paris. Um, I had the honor um, to co-chair the ADP between 2013 and 2014, um, which was quite an experience. My hair was a lot blacker um, before I started that process. It was, uh, <laughs> it's, it saw the breaking down of, 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 of the, of the North-South divide in more fundamental ways. Um, so the Paris Agreement was adopted in 2015. And in 2015, uh, the SDGs were, were also adopted. So the environmental agenda for the 21st century is largely defined by two uh, global policy instruments, the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, the Paris Agreement has two components, the, the, the core uh, legal text and its accompanying decisions to operationalize or to implement or to give effect to the agreement. Um, so overall, um, the Paris Agreement uh, agrees to limit global temperature increases to well below two degrees while urging efforts to limit the increase in temperature to 1.5. Um, while you might think that, well, what's the degree? You know, what's the difference between 2 and 1.5? And 1. It's a 0.5 uh, difference. But that is significant. And that text was, uh, that text was incorporated at the insistence of, of small island developing states and least developing countries because they were uh, uh, lost. They had the most to lose uh, with the support of some um, developed countries. And CARICOM played a critical part in that, um, led by St. Lucia. Um, the then minister, uh, Minister Fletcher, uh, who uh, spearheaded CARICOM um, situations or negotiations at, the, at that meeting. Um, it also provides for global peaking, meaning that all emissions from, from, uh, uh, from all sectors should be um, achieved as soon as possible. It doesn't give a time frame uh, with the aim of achieving a balance of emissions with sinks or, or mechanisms that reduce emissions or avoid emissions in the half of this uh, of, of the century, in the second half of the century. Balancing emissions with sinks means only one thing. It means carbon neutrality. So there's an agreement in, in, in the Paris Agreement that in the second half of the century, from 2050, that the world should strive to achieve carbon neutrality, which means that all emissions um, being given out by emitting sectors should be balanced by sinks. And sinks are for example, um, forests, because forests take in carbon dioxide, um, uh, carbon capture and storage uh, in geological formations where you take carbon dioxide from industrial processes such as ammonia and you store it underground in, um, in, in aquifers, for example, deep set aquifers or, or spent gas and oil wells, um, as well as some other things. Um, and to to follow this uh, implementation, it undertakes a global stock take every five years in the long term. And it provides uh, special 
significance to small island developing states. One of the underlying and most critical aspect of the, of the Paris Agreement is the establishment of commitments by all parties to take what are termed nationally determined contributions or domestic measures that will reduce or avoid emissions and to strengthen them over time based on national circumstances. So unlike the Kyoto Protocol, which was negotiated only for developed countries, and which is a top-down uh, target-based um, uh, sort of setting um, for countries, the Paris Agreement is entirely bottom-up, and hence the, the specific term nationally determined contributions. So that when parties say that we are going to do this, it means that they have already considered what is possible for them, uh, what is achievable for them, and they have said that this is what we are going to do. So it commits all parties to regularly report on their emissions and to track their progress of the NDCs um, and to submit new NDCs, uh, to submit new commitments every five years, with each successive commitment being more ambitious than the preceding one. When you add up all of the NDCs that all parties have submitted thus far, um, you, you compare it to what is required to achieve the two degrees or the 1.5 is a huge gap. It's called the emissions gap. So a lot more has to be done. So the, the, the agreement also calls for increasing ambition over time so that we can achieve this uh, two degrees as agreed to. It also provides for a market-based me mechanism, much like the CDM, uh, which allowed for emissions to be treated. Um, it also has a, a, a section on adaptation um, that seeks to build resilience in developing countries um, by, by, by enforcing or allowing or providing for an ad adaptation planning process to submit adaptation plans um, and to communicate that to the United Nations. All of this in an effort to, to facilitate financing because financing for developing countries is a critical issue, remains a critical issue. Um, and and these, uh, these processes would allow the development of plans to be submitted, for example, to the Green Climate Fund, which is now operational and is already disbursing uh, funds to developing countries. And I know Antigua and Barbuda, for example, has already accessed funding to do some work um, and, and therefore provides that framework for accessing finance. Uh, a new and sort of innovative aspect um, to climate change diplomacy in the Paris Agreement is something referred to as loss and damage which means that um, for some, climate change will have irreversible impacts on some sectors. So for example, if you have sea level rise and you lose a beach in, the, in a small island state, you're not going to get it back. So that's loss, it's gone forever. Um, and damage, irreversible damage. Before that, the term was adaptation, which means that you could adapt to the impacts of climate change by putting mechanisms in place to, to sort of mitigate against the impacts. Um, that over time has become to be recognized as not necessarily the optimal approach and that there, are, there is going to be irreversible loss and damage to amenities uh, uh, that will affect socioeconomic well-being in all countries and therefore a significant part of the Paris Agreement is this section on loss and damage and of course the issue of climate finance. Um, which is critical um, and speaks to mobilizing $100 billion a year to support um, developing countries and, of course, ramping it up. It's not a ceiling, but rather a floor, F-L-O-O-R, um, although some people might say it's a floor in the agreement. Um, but for the first time, we saw all parties uh, coming together to agree that they all will now contribute to the solution. Um, the, the, the lines between north and south have been significantly blurred, if not erased totally, um, but maintained in the context of the provision of finance by developed countries. So the Green Climate Fund, for example, is capitalized by donor countries, um, and also, for the first time, we see developing countries also contributing to the Green Climate Fund. So for example, Indonesia, Mexico have also contributed to the Green Climate Fund. So we, all, we, so we see there's a change in the, in, in the global dynamic of addressing climate change, both from, from a contributory uh, and participatory approach to also contributing to finance that will lead to, um, to, a, to a solution. A critical part is technology transfer because technology is, uh, is recognized as being one of the uh, 
driving force to the solutions and of course capacity building in capacity uh, challenged um, capacity challenged countries. As with all global agreements uh, where, where, where governments signed, everyone wants to know what each other is doing to keep their end of the bargain. And so it, it allows for a transparency and compliance regime where each party will now report on what it's doing and monitor uh, and verify that's, that what it says it's going to do is actually being done. And what is happening now is that the operational rules for the Paris Agreement is currently being negotiated uh, with a view of uh, completing in 2018. As I said, uh, climate change now is linked closely to development, and it's, it's linked to the SDGs, is, is specific and is explicit because goal 13 uh, speaks directly to addressing climate change. So th there's that nexus and there's that recognition. Uh, we are all familiar, I would assume, with the global uh, SDG goals. One of the more significant um, differences that have also blurred uh, the, the lines is the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, which means that all parties have a, uh, a, a common objective, but the extent to which they can achieve ob that objective will be differentiated amongst them all based on their cap capacity and their capability. That has been a, 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 a principle that has divided the North and the South over time, but that has also been diluted to some extent by a rephrasing of the principle that says now uh, CBDR in the light of different national circumstances. And that was a phrase coined uh, bilaterally between China and the United States uh, previously. So what it means now is that um, while you have a, a differentiated responsibilities, that differentiation can change over time depending on national circumstances because you will develop, you, you will become more technologically savvy, uh, you will develop capacity and therefore that differentiation should change over time. So it's not a strict divide of North versus South anymore. And that, that's a, uh, a significant part of, the, of the, the, the climate agreement, the Paris Agreement. Um, it also specifically recognizes the need uh, for looking at uh, the, the best available science as the basis for action. Um, that has also been previously um, articulated in the precautionary principle, one of the underlying principles of the United Nations Convention. Um, it also acknowledges that climate change is, is beyond an environmental issue. It's no longer an environmental issue merely, but it's cross-cutting with impacts across the entire socioeconomic landscape, whether it's agriculture, health, uh, transportation, uh, human settlements and infrastructure, um, food production, fisheries, um, the whole biophysical environment uh, impacts on the socioeconomic well-being. Um, so what is the overall impact of the, the, the climate change uh, agreement, the Paris Agreement? Um, the former executive secretary of the, the convention, Christiana Figueres, um, said, uh, which uh, words that which ring true, is that business as usual is now risky business. So the, the advent of the Paris Agreement is such that it is not going to be business as usual. So the North-South divide uh, is not going to uh, persist um, as all countries have now agreed to, to contribute because action is required by all countries and all countries have now submitted their nationally determined contributions to address the problem. Um, and it's a bottom-up approach. So it, it, it's not to say that your countries are being forced to say you must do this. You're leaving it up to countries to say, well, you determine what you can do. But we know that what you can do collectively is not enough, so therefore you are encouraged to raise ambition over time in order to achieve the common objective of reducing or limiting temperature increases to two degrees or 1.5. So it is not going to be business as usual. What other, uh, we have seen um, uh, that the Paris Agreement has sent a strong signal to business and the private sector. So, for example, more than 800 of the largest companies in the world, uh, just prior to, to, to Paris, uh, supported a strong climate change regime because they know that uh, that, that is the future. Adjusting climate change would be the future, and it's a, it's a, it's a threat to their, their business. And in the early days, for example, in, um, in the lead up to the 1992 uh, adoption of the, the, the parent convention, 
uh, oil and gas companies um, formed what was then the Climate Coalition. Uh, and it is said that they actually paid scientists to refute the established science of climate change. So you had one camp of sciences, scientists saying it's not happening, and another camp saying, well, this is what is here. Um, the unfortunate consequence of that was that climate change turned into a belief system. So you believe that climate change is happening or you don't believe that climate change is happening in spite of the overwhelming science and the scientific evidence. And we are, we are seeing that playing out internationally um, with some countries to the north of us, for example. Um, both developing and developed countries have also come together um, to uh, increase their research and development in renewable energies and clean technologies. So for example, Australia, Brazil, Canada, Chile, Denmark, um, some of the United Arab Emirates, um, which is an oil producing country, have come together uh, to ramp up their ambition, to pledge their um, support, and to increase their research and investment in clean technologies. So we are now seeing a, a total shift in the geopolitical landscape in terms of addressing climate change and what it is doing for climate diplomacy in the, in the 20th century, in the 21st century, rather. Uh, the, the government of India, the Prime Minister Modi in, in, in Paris also uh, led an initiative called the, um, uh, the Solar Alliance, which includes 121 countries uh, ramping up their investments in clean energy. Um, and if you look at the global trends in renewable energy for 2015, um, global investments in renewable power um, are 265 billion. It was more than double the allocations for new coal uh, and gas generation, for example. Um, investments in, in, in countries have increased uh, uh, significantly, uh, and you can see the, the numbers there. Um, as recent as last year or early this year, I think Saudi Arabia, who perhaps single-handedly controls the price of oil, um, has invested 50 billion US dollars in what is supposed to be one of the largest solar plants in, in, the, in the world. Uh, I think that is the ambition. United Arab Emirates have also followed so we are seeing now oil and gas producing countries shifting their investments away from oil and gas into renewable energy. And we see that happening in 2015. In 2016, for the same equivalent investment in 2015, we had 23% more renewable energy capacity worldwide, which means that the technology is getting cheaper, investments um, are increasing. Um, and we see that that trend will also continue, is likely to continue, and we've seen uh, it happening uh, in 2016. So what does that mean for, for countries of the world now that we have seen this sort of geopolitical uh, earthquake, if you want, because it has fundamentally transformed um, how countries now do business with each other, for example. As with, with anything uh, associated with, with changes in political positions, our challenges and opportunities. So why climate change has a, a, an environmental genesis um, is impact are being recognized as multi-sectoral and potentially dangerous to developing countries in particular, but poses an existential threat to, to small and developing states. Some islands of the, of the, of the South Pacific are already lost. Uh, as, as recent as, as a few years ago, Solomon Islands lost a, a couple of islands. The Maldives have lost uh, many of the atolls. And um, Kiribati and, uh, and Tuvalu are, are under a significant threat and maybe the first set of climate refugees um, that the world may see. Um, so it, it, it proves to be uh, or, or, uh, an existential threat to small island developing um, states. So um, taking advantage of these opportunities that the new uh, paradigm uh, may be created is, is critical, um, f uh, as a critical part of, of 21st century um, climate um, policy. So the opportunities include creation of jobs, green jobs, um, innovative technology centers, for example, manufacturing opportunities for, for green technology, and economic diversification away from countries that have uh, core uh, oil and gas um, economies. So as a consequence, addressing climate change is a global challenge that will need a multidisciplined and multi 
pronged approach with strong geopolitical will and determination. So it requires, therefore, active participation, and stress being active by all countries. Um, we have seen recently uh, the actions by the U.S. to, um, to withdraw from the, the Paris Agreement, um, coming on the heels of what was hyped uh, as a, a significant breakthrough in climate diplomacy uh, with the adoption of, the, of the, 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 climate, uh, the Paris Agreement. So what does it mean? Was it therefore uh, a, a, a sort of premature end or premature climax for the, for the Paris Agreement? And to coin a term from a, a popular card game in Trinidad, um, would it be, could it set an example for, for Trump and follow suit in all fours? Um, if you know that, you, you trump and you take all the cards and you follow suit for what was played before. So is there a risk of, of Trump and follow suit um, to follow the US? Um, they are the second largest producer of greenhouse gases. Um, the achievement of the objective of the Paris Agreement is highly dependent on mitigation action by the US because they account for a large amount of emissions, as they did before. Um, however, the decision of the US as a sovereign country must be respected uh, based on the underpinning principle of uh, national sovereignty in international law. Um, and there may be a risk that other countries may follow the uh, lead and also withdraw from the Paris Agreement. Uh, and, and that will also sort of change the, the geopolitical landscape. Paris, Paris, uh, the Paris Agreement was a, a difficult negotiation and reaching agreement um, was a red letter achievement in environment and in climate uh, diplomacy, as I've alluded to before. So for the first time in history uh, of the climate negotiations, all countries, both developed and developing countries, um, small emitters, large emitters, uh, small and developing states, least developing countries, agreed to contribute to a truly global effort uh, in a sustained way to restrict temperature increases and to avoid catastrophic impacts of climate change. So it's a, it's a huge uh, achievement. Paris was agreed uh, in the lead up to the US presidential elections, as we, as we know. Um, the Paris Agreement provides, though, that um, any country that may wish to withdraw from the agreement must do so um, only three years after it has come into force for them. So the United States um, ratified the Paris Agreement in 2016. It came into force for them on November 4th, 2016. It means, therefore, that uh, their withdrawal, um, they can only formally withdraw from the uh, agreement on November 5th, 2019. And it takes effect one year after notice is served. So it takes effect in 2020. You can do the math. Um, so it will take four years, um, basically, for uh, the US to sort of formally be out of the agreement. However, um, while the US uh, announcement would have had immediate political impact, there have been strong reactions from, from the international community, from other countries. So for example, following on the heels of, uh, of that announcement, the, the China, China and the European Union issued a joint statement of committed implementation, um, along with India and France and so on. Um, China, in fact, um, made a statement that they will not have, or, or they will not uh, institutionalize coal-fired power plants. Uh, there will be no new coal-fired power plants. So it was a sort of a, a, a reaction um, that was quite contrary to the in intentions and the reason death of the US for, for withdrawing from the Paris Agreement, which was, it was a, a, a challenge to the United uh, States e economy. Um, it would have uh, impacted on, on the coal mining industry and so on. So it is therefore very likely that the Paris Agreement will subsist uh, and the US absence, at least for some time, will make it harder for the achievement of the, opti of the objective of the Paris Agreement, which is limiting temperatures. Uh, but it is hoped that the US will certainly come back um, or remain uh, at some point. Uh, that is not to be the case, because we have heard only recently that they have formally 
signal to the United Nations that they are going to withdraw. Notwithstanding that federal or that uh, national signal, um, climate action implementation in the US is being done at the state level with state governments. Um, and uh, as of August 8, for example, as last week, um, Orlando became the 40th US city to commit to 100% renewable energy by 2050. So we are seeing an increase in uh, climate action at the state level, notwithstanding that the US um, has withdrawn or intends to withdraw from the, the uh, Paris Agreement. So climate action is increasing. And maybe that's uh, sort of the saving grace. So what is likely next? Um, we've said that the objectives of the Paris Agreement will be perhaps difficult to achieve without the US. Uh, it is a global challenge that requires a global response. Um, and this is the recognition that gave rise to the Paris Agreement. Um, we have seen growing political momentum for climate action throughout the world. Um, if anything, it appears that the reaction to the US has been to strengthen resolve to make Paris um, a success and achievable. Uh, the momentum has been um, and will continue to be sustained by the economic case for action and the growing economic opportunities that will be afforded to countries who have embarked on a low carbon uh, transition or low carbon emissions. Uh, 159 parties have ratified the Paris Agreement um, as of 15th August, which was yesterday, uh, and agreed to, uh, to pursue the 1.5 degree limit in global warming. Um, this continues to be, or is likely to be, the, the, the pathway to prosperity um, for countries in the future. Yeah, renewable energy is the future, uh, and this is the economic react reality if we see, the, if we had to follow the trends, both uh, in public uh, policy and in private uh, sector investments and private sector direction. Uh, meanwhile, uh, renewable energy uptake is exceeding all expected um, uh, uh, reasonable expectations, rather. Uh, energy prices are falling for renewable energy. Um, and in the US alone, paradoxically, the renewable energy sector employs more American workers than the fossil fuel industry. Um, so going forward, therefore, what is required is engagement, engagement, engagement. We need universal ratification for effective implementation. Um, and for us here in the region, um, all CARICOM countries have ratified except for Trinidad and Tobago and Suriname. I, but I can uh, quickly add that uh, the ratification process is under active consideration of the cabinet of Trinidad and Tobago, and we hope that um, we can join the list of uh, ratif ratified parties uh, pretty soon because non ratification risks um, undermining the full potency. Of, of diplomacy to be derived from the Paris Agreement. Um, and active participation in negotiations at every forum is critical in order to have a voice and to stake claims as the rules of the Paris Agreement um, uh, are negotiated and, and finalized, uh, and find ways to overcome challenges based on limited human and financial uh, resources. It has to be recognized that climate change is a development issue, and it's not a sectoral environment issue as some uh, People like to think uh, it's cross-cutting, um, and it, transcend, it transcends political partisanship, and therefore is a core national development issue that needs to be addressed. The role of parliaments, therefore, could be or should be uh, to provide oversight on climate change issues uh, to, Im to, 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 to uh, inspect of implementation, uh, inspect of transparency, and trans in respect of governance as provided for in the Paris Agreement. Um, and that could take the form. Uh, that could take form in, in many ways. Uh, in our own parliament here, for example, you have joint select committees of parliament that could could perhaps look at at, uh, at at implementing climate change issues and addressing climate change issues amongst other development issues and integrating it into its uh, deliberations. Um, because uh, NDC implementation will require monitoring. It will require reporting and it will require verification which is a long-term process beyond the normal five-year electoral process because Paris Agreement is here for the long term um, and the long haul. Uh, one of the things that uh, was agreed to in terms of uh, negotiating the Paris Agreement is, is that it must be durable, it must be flexible, 
uh, and must be transparent so that every party will know what each other is doing. Uh, accessing climate finance, technology transfer, and capacity building is critical for developing countries and small agencies in particular. Uh, and, and the governance structures, the transparency uh, structures, will have to play a critical role in accessing these uh, uh, resources. Um, countries that are tackling climate change will uh, head on as a, as a development issue and, and rapidly transitioning to low carbon economies, for example, will save funds over the long term and secure competitive advantage in the near term. Uh, because it, it, dirty fuel, dirty technology is not competitive, it's a lot of wastage. Uh, the private sector will tell you that. So those who grab the, 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 the bull by the horns very early are likely to see more uh, tangible benefits in the short term, uh, but it takes a, a sort of will to, to really challenge it uh, head on. Um, there's a real and significant risk that countries may, be, may miss out on the, uh, on the boom in green jobs that are now uh, occurring and the opportunities for economic growth because the future lies with clean, sustainable energy and that will define a new era of economic development. And that is becoming increasingly uh, recognized. And therefore, uh, this is the overall, I'm submitting that this is the overall and the overarching challenge for, for national parliaments to provide the oversight, to provide the governance structures that will uh, look at climate change as a national development issue. And that brings me to the end. I thank you very much. Um, I'm open for any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Mr. Kumar Singh. At this time, if there are any questions from our audience, both online and here, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and we will bring the microphone to you. Orban Hill, uh, Deputy President of the Senate from Jamaica. I hear your comment that global warming is a global issue. However, as I look at what has happened uh, in terms of really approaching global warming, apart from backing off from burning um, uh, fossil fuels, which obviously China and India have been giving, giving a pass on, two of the biggest burners of fossil fuel, it would seem to me that us in the Caribbean um, could take a much different approach. We see what Germany has done, funding um, renewable energy to an extensive and in fact some people say excessive uh, level at this stage. But we in the Caribbean have much more um, global horizontal radiance than Germany will ever have. We have in some places in Jamaica eight and Germany has two point something. And yet we have not used the renewable energy option of stop fighting and worrying about fossil fuel. That, those are the guys who burn it can deal with that. They're big guys, some will withdraw, some will get a buy, whatever. We are spending money to Saudi Arabia, to the United States, to Venezuela that we cannot afford and will not invest either individually or collectively in the Caribbean. What do you suggest from the studies that you have made and how do you suggest that we get governments and private investors to take this stock while the others who burn fossil fuel worry about it? Thank you for the comment and, uh, and, and the question. Um, the, the reality is that, um, it, and I made a comment before, is that we have to transition. It's a transition to a low carbon economy or a low emission economy. It, it, it won't happen in a switch or today for tomorrow. Um, it requires political will. Uh, it requires a recognition that there are opportunities now uh, globally. You, 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 the funding is now available for many, many countries um, to tap into to transform national economies towards a low, trans, a low carbon uh, development path. So it, it, it requires national uh, sort of the enabling environment to be set in place uh, that will allow investment in, uh, in, in renewable energy, in energy efficiency technologies, for example. Um, but that, that has to be, that is the way uh, of the future. The uh, trends are clear. 
Um, it all depends as well on national development aspirations. Uh, so tra transitioning is the key. Uh, it will be difficult to switch today uh, into tomorrow from a, 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 a sort of fossil fuel based uh, economy into a, a totally renewable energy economy, but the transition has to start to um, manifest itself uh, in the national landscape. So the opportunities now have to be taken by, by, by nations uh, to tap into the, 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 the increasing uh, economic resources that are being made available for renewable energy, for clean energy, for clean technology. Um, and that can only be done through national and political will, uh, a policy that says that this is how we're going to do it. But more than that, to establish the sort of governance structures nationally that will allow the enabling environment uh, to persist or to be created uh, that will uh, facilitate uh, investments in, in clean energy. We have the largest nuclear um, power plant available to us, and that's the sun. Uh, we have, on average, 12 hours of, of, of sunlight. And if the United Kingdom can invest in solar energy, we have no excuse. I hope I answered your question. Good morning. Is it on? Um, I'm happy to hear that the north-south lines have been blurred. Uh, my background actually is in meteorology. And I attended some of those uh, plenary sessions on climate change uh, in the early 1990s. And I can remember clearly uh, when I attended the plenary session in Washington, D.C., when George W. Bush Sr. was the president, uh, the developing countries were concerned about the depletion of the ozone layer, sea level rise in particular, and um, they were asking for financial assistance for the transfer of technology uh, and for replacement of, say, aerosol sprays at the time that emitted a lot of the CFCs. And <clears throat> the United States took the position at that time that um, there was no, not a really a global warming trend when they saw the, the request for financial assistance and that it was cyclic. And so I'm not surprised now that the United States has taken a position to withdraw prior to the implementation of the Paris Agreement, which legally uh, would not bind them because their withdrawal is constructive. Uh, and so we have a circumstance now where in the developing world, uh, I believe, must move towards uh, an educational process. And my question is, um, I didn't hear you uh, in, indicate what measures were being taken to uh, develop an educational program so that the developing countries could be more aware of the risks and the dangers. Because it's clear, in the Bahamas, for example, the highest point is 206 feet. And so we're very vulnerable to sea level rise. And it's clear, if you look at the Atlantic hurricane season, that there is uh, a greater frequency of storm with higher intensity. And so, I believe we need the educational programs going. And uh, my question is, what is being done about educating the developing world uh, uh, with regard to the risks? Thank you for the comment and the question. Um, maybe I should say that um, the convention itself uh, has an article, a separate article on, on public awareness uh, uh, and capacity building and education um, that parties are obligated to implement. Uh, the level to which that is being done, of course, rests with the, with the capability and the capacity and the will of, of, of the party. 
Um, I, uh, I hope that what we are doing here today is also part of that public education uh, and awareness process, and I think I'm addressing um, some very important people. Uh, because the, the uh, awareness has to be uh, both lateral and, and vertical. Uh, and it, change can only come through policy-based uh, action. And therefore, awareness at the high level, uh, at the parliamentary level, at, 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 at the cabinet level, at the government level, is, is critical um, and has to be complemented by uh, an awareness at the community level because um, everyone is... is, is uh, will be affected. Um, for us here in Trinidad, for example, uh, we have a national climate change policy that, that uh, uh, allows for uh, public education. But what you also have is, is what is called a, a climate change focal point network, which has at, at this time, I think 200 representatives um, from each government ministry, agency, the private sector, banks, credit unions, NGOs, CBOs, private sector industry, uh, where we exchange information, we get, in, we get their inputs, we exchange information from them, uh, or with them, sorry. Um, and so they, they, they're kept in the loop uh, in terms of what, what is happening at the policy level. But I think, I think you are correct that, that primarily, uh, if policy uh, drives action at the national level, as it should and as it does, then education at the policy maker level is, is in my view, the most critical component. Uh, and I hope that this, this forum today uh, would contribute to that, that education process. And as you said, you meteorologists, I just look at the, the website this morning, and there are four, there, there's, there's a hurricane and three potential systems, one behind the other, um, coming off the Atlantic. So you're right, uh, extreme weather events are going to, to cost um, uh, countries more and more over time if it's not addressed. Any further questions? Thank you, sir, for your very uh, learned and, and informative uh, address. Now, I noted your statements with respect to the creation of saints. And uh, in terms of, as I understand it, the creation of, of, of forests and so on, that, that is understandable, um, it's practical. Uh, we, we are moving into an age of paperless uh, communication and so on, so we won't have to depend very heavily on, on using uh, paper and, and therefore deforesting the place and so on. Fine. But I was concerned, I was attracted to your, your idea of then storage, storing carbon dioxide in underground wells and so on. And my problem with that is uh, it's a man-made... Um, it's a man-made process, and of course, there can be accidents. <laughs> what, 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 then, what therefore are the implications if there's some accident and, and this escapes en masse? Secondly, um, I note that you've said, look, based on where we are now, what, we've, what has happened so far will affect us within about three decades and so on. That is significant. So what, I was interest, what I'm interested in knowing, has any effort been made to see how we can reverse the, the, the process, and, and is that possible? Thank you. Okay, the, the, the first part, the easier part. Um, carbon capture and storage has been a contentious issue under the negotiations, and Trinidad Tobago has been an advocate um, of carbon capture and storage for obvious reasons. Um, it is now an eligible activity under the CDM um, uh, that comes with a whole string of conditions and, and caveats in terms of accidents. But the, the thing with, with uh, carbon capture and storage is that uh, it, the technology is expensive. It's very, very expensive. But it has been identified by the interpanel, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change as an essential technology if we have to reverse climate change. Um, because it's one of those technologies that need to be refined, all the conditions and uh, uh, the, the risks that you had um, uh, alluded to need to be addressed um, uh, if climate change has to be reversed. And maybe that uh, sort of uh, segues into your, your second part. Um, 
reversing climate change uh, is a huge challenge. Um, mitigating emissions as it is, uh, is, 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 is tremendous because all of the actions that countries have said that they will take, when you add up the aggregate emissions that are going to be reduced, and what is required for keeping temperatures below two degrees by 2100, there's a huge gap. So the actions being taken by parties at the moment is still not sufficient uh, to address the, the, the emissions required to keep temperatures under uh, two degrees, far less for 1.5. So what is required is more uh, is increased ambition uh, by parties to reduce their emissions over time, to increase their, 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 their targets over time. But with that will come the, the, the need for, for climate finance, and that is where developed countries have a, a, an obligation to provide finance. But it, more than that, it fundamentally, because it's a nationally determined effort, bottom, bottom up, it requires a, a will at the national level and a determination to transform into a low carbon economy uh, over time, uh, and hopefully in time, uh, so that catastrophic uh, climate change um, uh, will not occur uh, at some point in the future. We're already seeing uh, signals of that happening. Uh, large masses of, of Antarctica uh, uh, are being sheared off. Um, whether, that is con whether that is a natural uh, sort of ice dynamic, or, uh, or whether contributed to, is being contributed by climate change, uh, I think the verdict is, is, is still out there. But we are seeing signs that the models have already projected uh, coming to pass. Um, so I would say that uh, while it is difficult to reduce, it is certainly possible to contain. Uh, good morning. Uh, Bridget Ann is a George Speaker of Trinidad and Tobago House of Representatives. Two things interest me, Mr. Kumar Singh. You spoke about the global stock taking every five years under the Paris Agreement. What entity, um, independent entity, takes this stock taking exercise? Secondly, when does the five year period begin to run? And thirdly, are there sanctions within the agreement for failure to meet your own targets? And I have one, maybe I should give you that one time too. In terms of the I think maybe no time in the world have we seen such mass movements by people, um, immigrants, refugees. Are there any geopolitical responses to the climate refugees that we're beginning to see and which are likely to increase with the effect of climate change? Thank you. Thank you for the question. First, the, uh the stock take, the stock take, uh, the first stock take is uh, scheduled for 2023. Um, there is a system called an MRV system um, uh, that is uh, defined under the, the, the uh, climate process, international climate process, that speaks to measuring or monitoring, the M is for that, uh, reporting uh, and verification. And the verification is to be done um, by third party independent entities. Um, so each country, according to those guidelines, it, uh, uh, is to set up an MRV system nationally and then from that MRV system report to uh, the UN on, on its uh, progress in implementing the, the NDC. So the, the, the body that will undertake this stock take is the, global, is the supreme decision-making uh, body of the, of, the, of, the, of the conference, which is the, the conference of the parties. Um, but it will depend on, on national governance issues, national transparency structures uh, premised on the monitoring, reporting, and verification system, the MRV system. Um, and and, and, and uh, like is to begin in 2023 and five years uh, thereafter. That was two questions, yeah? That was the first two questions. This, the this third question was... Sanctions, okay. Uh, from one of my earlier slides, you would have seen um, that the, the rules on the Paris Agreement are now being negotiated. Now, under the Kyoto Protocol, there was a compliance regime, a compliance committee. Uh, it was a top-down uh, sort of a committee that had two branches, uh, a judicial branch and a facilitative branch. Um, 
so there were some sort of uh, sanctions, though not, not entirely punitive, and there was a facilitator branch that um, engaged with countries who were non-compliant to, to bring them back on stream. The compliance system under the Paris Agreement is, is still being negotiated, but it is clear um, uh, in the Paris Agreement that the, that, that compliance is not to be punitive. Uh, so it is expected that the rules once agreed will be such that it will be largely facilitative where countries that are not compliant will be provided with assistance and advice on how to become compliant or facilitative, uh, facilitated to bring them back on, on stream. So th th there is no punitive action. If anything uh, that may flow from, from non-compliance would be international shame. Because then countries would have already and first up said, well, this is what we are going to do. Uh, uh, because nobody said, well, this is what you should do. You, the country said, this is what we are going to do, this is what we are committed to. Um, and everything, uh, including finance and technology and capacity, uh, you know, uh, efforts are being made to make those things available for countries to, to access in order to implement their commitments. So that if anything that will flow uh, from, from non-compliance is, is that is ultimately an international or what, what is, I suppose, the, the most, uh, Potent is, is international shame, um, but there are no punitive, um, there are no punitive uh, measures that your fines or anything like that uh, likely to, to, to be in the rules because it is clear in the Paris Agreement that it will be non-punitive. Um, on the migration, uh, well, there's a separate UN body that deals with migration. I, I can't say if 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 that body uh, in their deliberations at the moment. Uh, may be considering environmental refugees. I know there was some talk about it, but I'm not sure if there is an active uh, consideration of what will or what could be potentially climate refugees um, having to migrate um, from one place to the other based on uh, climate change impacts. Um, so I, I, I plead um, on that basis. Derek Taylor here from Turks and Caicos. What I want to find out is how and where is the non-English speaking Caribbean and the whole scheme of things have, have been looking at engaging um, and the, the challenges that we've been facing as we've, we've learned from the whole era of hurricanes and, and uh, this El Nino and La Nina and the, the whole works. Can you uh, and enlighten us on what is going on with the non-English speaking Caribbean? Yeah, well the non-English speaking Caribbean uh, countries are, or are also parties to, to the Paris Agreement um, and to the Climate Change Convention. So the same opportunities um, are av available to them. Um, and in fact, um, Cuba, if I were to single out w w one country, um, is far advanced in its climate modeling, for example. And the climate change, uh, the CARICOM Climate Change Center uh, in Belize has a close cooperation with, 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 with INSMET of Cuba um, uh, that, and, and relies on them for modeling outputs that feed into the climate advice uh, to governments of the Caribbean that they were set up to do. So the non-English non speaking Caribbean countries uh, are already playing um, a critical role in the region um, in supporting climate action in the region. I don't know if I answered your question. Mr. Kumarasin, Shirley Osborne, speaker from Montserrat. Um, about a month or so ago, the Ministry of Agriculture in Montserrat, which is also the ministry responsible for the environment, issued a memo to the effect that, I didn't hear it, but I, to the effect that people who uh, were burning coals uh, were no longer allowed to. I don't think it was quite that extreme, but the, the, the talk around Montserrat was, well, now those people who you know, light the barbecue on Saturday afternoon can no longer set a coal pit because the government says so. Now, in 2012, I showed up for work in Zhengzhou in China in a white shirt, my first day in the university, and my students were brushing black spots off my shirt because literally it was falling from the skies. Um, and when they, give the, when they gave the, um, the, weather, the weather forecasts at that time, they'd also include what the, the coal, the, the, the droppings would be. My students tell me now it's not quite so bad. Now, that's both sides of the spectrum. Uh, but both sides need to continue working on this issue. Can you maybe tell us a little bit of what you know about how China has been managing this? Well, China has decreed that there will be no new coal-fired 
power plants um, uh, in, in China. And what they have done at the same time is ramp up their investments in, in renewable energy and, and clean energy. So, so again, it's not a switch. They are transitioning away uh, from, from coal-fired um, uh, power plants. Um, it's a huge, I mean, China is the most voracious um, consumer of energy uh, because of their size and, and their development aspirations. Um, but again, it demonstrates that there's a huge political will if you know that you have uh, taken a decision to move away from your mainstay energy source, which is coal, and recognize that it's, it's, it's dirty to go to renewables and cleaner technology. Uh, but there's a close nexus to what you've been referred to uh, in, in Montserrat, and I assume that that also has to do with a secondary driver, uh, not necessarily climate change as the primary driver, and that is the issue of air quality and the, the impacts air quality have on human health. Uh, because bad air quality also equates to poor human health, and poor human health equates to higher public health costs. So it impacts on your, your national budget and your, your GDP. So that's why in, uh, in arriving at solutions for climate change, uh, we speak of win-win-win solutions or, or measures being taken that will benefit everyone or, or measures worth doing anyway. Uh, the the so-called um, low-cost, no-cost measures. Um, so there, there may be some uh, other drivers to, to, for example, banning coal. It could be an issue related to human health. I know China, for example, um, their, 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 their air quality issues that they have to grapple with has also been a driver uh, to moving away from, from, from coal uh, and the associated uh, air pollution issues in, in, uh, associated with burning coal. So um, I think both, of, both sort of policy drivers uh, act in tandem, and synergistically, I would assume. Good morning. Thank you very much for the lecture. Ladies first. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for giving way, sir. Good morning. I am Karen Utley. I heard you made mention of a 200-strong group that meet in Trinidad concerning climate change and global warming. And I'm trying to link that to your statement that climate change and its effect is a developmental issue. And I'm wondering how much of the deliberation of that 200 strong committee, how much of that deliberation filters into policy making in terms of financing? Because in Tobago, we have our issues with, well, physically we are a narrow island, and we have the, the constraint of, let's, like, for instance, weaning of water and salinity and how much it costs for um, distribution of potable water. We also have the issue of our agricultural produce and the, the, the um, productivity of the, of the land if we were to take the effects of global warming and climate change to its extreme. So I'm, cons I'm, I'm wondering about how much of that deliberation from the committee linked to the issue of the effect of climate change and global warming is a development issue, how much is filtered into our national allocations and budgetary provisions. Mm, thank you. The, I should have qualified a little uh, better maybe, but the, the, the 200 strong uh, focal point network is, is, a, is an e-group basically where we actually do solicit um, views from, from, from various parties that will contribute to policy uh, development. So for example, the national climate change policy, which is now due for revision and should be revised uh, very soon, um, will benefit from, from the interaction with these uh, uh, representatives of the, of the network. Uh, to inform um, policy objectives. And maybe just to bring it on to a, a local level, um, we, we have been engaging recently on a, 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 on a vulnerability and assessment uh, project in Trinidad and in Tobago. Um, and particularly for Tobago, it has been uh, transformed into a, a, a sort of ridge to reef approach that looks at all uh, aspects of, of climate impacts. Um, and we have been consulting with um, various uh, stakeholders in Tobago, uh, various uh, divisions of the THA, um, to get their inputs. Um, and 
and some of these divisions and some members that you've met with are also part of that network. So we see it as a dynamic um, exchange of views and information. And it actually was um, designed to do two things, basically. One, to disseminate uh, information and to educate and, and make aware, but also to get feedback um, on, on, on policy um, guidance. Uh, it serves as a nice sort of platform for consultations with a, a wide range of stakeholders. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was informative and somewhat worrying. Uh, you mentioned the CARICOM Climate Change Office in Belize. And I'm going to ask a question. Looking at the broad sweep of CARICOM, with the knowledge you have of the imponderables. Uh, our needs are immediate. The resources are very limited. And the issues that confront us will not wait. What do you see as our prospects in the Caribbean for treating with what we have before us? Thank you. Yeah. I had alluded to the leadership shown by St. Lucia uh, at the Paris negotiations um, in the eventual adoption of the Paris Agreement. Uh, CARICOM uh, is not different in, in, in terms of its characteristics uh, of its members from, from the vulnerable countries of the world, uh, small island developing states, low-lying coastal areas. Um, and therefore, the, the requisite capacity um, needs to be built. The CARICOM Climate Change Center has been doing a very, an excellent job at advising uh, regional governments um, on, on climate change issues, both from a scientific aspect, uh, building their capacity through uh, programs on climate change vulnerability adaptation, for example, um, and as well, uh, creating a unified voice at the climate change negotiations. Um, so what CARICOM, I would, I would, I would proffer, uh, needs to, to do is really coordinate um, and speak as one voice. Uh, it has so far been a very potent voice within the alliance of small island states and within the negotiations themselves. Um, but that requires, and you see from my last couple of slides, engagement, engagement, engagement. It has to be done at every level um, of, of technical uh, uh, deliberations and, and political negotiations. It has to be done at every level. CARICOM has to, has to be speak with, with one voice. Um, there are disparate uh, interests in the Caribbean, we know that, um, but that has not uh, manifested itself in any diametric uh, sort of uh, opposite views that would have prevented uh, common positions. So I would say um, closer coordination um, through uh, the Climate Change Center, uh, starting with uh, participation by national governments. Um, would be a good starting point. Well, it's already started, so it needs to continue and become more effective. Thank you. Um, good morning again. Um, I just wanted to ask, in terms of the monitoring, reporting, and verification that needs to take place, uh, what assistance is given to small island states or developing countries, financial or otherwise? Uh, most of the multilateral uh, donors through international organizations like, for example, UNDP, UNEP, um, uh, have provided funds uh, that can be used to develop um, uh, MRV systems. Uh, so the Green Climate Fund, for example, is a, is, a, is a case in point where you can access monies from them to develop capacity issues. Um, Trinidad and Tobago, for example, has already developed its MRV system um, some time ago. Um, using uh, UNDP and using its low emission capacity building program, which we negotiated for uh, five years ago, maybe, um, to be incorporated, to incorporate Trinidad and Tobago as part of that program. So finance is available. Um, uh, again, it depends on, uh, on, on the national circumstances and the national sort of policy direction. Um, the thing is, uh, the Paris Agreement was originally um, in the Durban decision to negotiate it, um, 
declared that the, the Paris Agreement or that agreement, whatever it was, would take effect in 2020. So everyone, every country had this thing in mind that this will happen in 2020. It will be coming to force in 2020. When the negotiations at the political level took place, at the heads level in Paris, that phrase disappeared. And what happened eventually was, a, 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 again, and I feel to mention it, but it reminds me that it was the fastest ratification. Uh, Paris was ratified in less than a year uh, because countries just started to deposit their instruments of ratification. And so the first meeting of the Paris Agreement um, took place last year in Marrakesh, uh, 2016, uh, within the space of one year of, of the, of the uh, instrument being adopted, compared to the Kyoto Protocol, for example, which took about eight years. Um, so if that was uh, any indication of where uh, political will uh, stood, uh, I think it is clear that the geopolitical um, policy direction is taking, uh, is looking in a different direction. Um, so funds are available. Uh, we, we, Trinidad Tobago, that is, took uh, a decision a long time ago, actually, when we developed the carbon reduction strategy um, that commenced in 2009. It culminated in 2014. It was adopted by cabinet in 2015. And we were able to use that as the basis for the NDC. Um, and we were the first Caribbean country to, sub to submit uh, NDC to, uh, to the United Nations. Um, and we used the uh, multilateral donors, the international organizations, and the funding available to develop our MRV system. So we hope to, to sort of roll out that MRV system as a pilot uh, phase, um, certainly by the beginning of next year. Uh, but as a short uh, answer, it's available. Um, the funding is available uh, through multilateral donors, even bilaterally, um, with some of the donor countries. That, that it depends on, all, on how countries can negotiate uh, the, 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 and access uh, the funding. Uh, just let me quickly add that to access the Green Climate Fund, for example, there are requisite uh, national structures that need to, put, to be put in place. So for example, you must have an entity called a National Designated Authority that is the focal point uh, and through which all projects are channeled for funding through the GCF. So there's some work to do at the national level in order to access funding from the GCF in particular. But there, uh, there's a wide range of other funding that would be available to develop MRV systems. We can take one more question. Thank you. I, I just want to, to be practical, huh? I've, I've heard you mentioning um, political will. That ties in, of course, with the economic implications. Uh, there are a number of countries whose economies depend on the fossil fuel. Uh, we've had uh, some discussion at home with respect to um, uh, reducing duties on eco-friendly vehicles, but we know that uh, the government depends a lot on, on th these duties to fuel its work, et cetera. So uh, my first question is, are you really being practical about it, or are we, isn't it a case where we are just um, paying lip service to the whole question of, 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 of um, re reducing the, the effects of climate change and so on? And secondly, you referred to uh, nuclear energy. At first, I, I thought you were looking at the, the other so-called clean um, uh, energy. Now, I have never been one who subscribed to the view that uh, just one superpower should have access to nuclear energy and so on, uh, and nuclear weapons, etc. So I wonder whether any consideration has been given to that as an alternate source of energy. Thank you. Well, my reference to nuclear, having access to the largest nuclear plant um, available to the planet is the sun, because the sun provides energy through nuclear reactions. <laughs> I was sort of being metaphorical about that. Um, but um, nuclear energy is, uh, is emissions free, and, and, and there are countries that have nuclear energy plants um, and continue to, to build nuclear, nuclear plants. So um, how you manage that waste, uh, I, I suppose countries that have experience and have the skill and the capacity to manage waste and, and the experience in, in nuclear energy production um, might consider doing it. It's not specifically banned under the agreement. Um, well, there's no reference to it either. Um, in terms of the practicality, um, 
that is why, um, well, I, I, I hope it's not lip service, let's say. Um, but it all depends on national circumstances. Uh, and that is why we speak to a transition uh, to, to a low-carbon economy and not a switch, uh, because you don't switch one day to the next. You transition based on your own economic circumstances, based on your socioeconomic uh, outlook, your, your, your GDP projections, for example, what you can afford, what you can't afford, what you need uh, assistance with in terms of policy reform, in terms of uh, economic diversification. All of these things need to be considered in one pot uh, and not isolated in silos. Um, so otherwise, you begin, you, you begin to, um, to be myopic. Uh, and, and if you are myopic, um, then you become a voice in the wilderness. And then you, you, you effect no change. So all of these considerations have to be taken as a whole in one pot as, as part of the, 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 the transitionary process um, because it is required. Uh, countries that, that fail to do it, uh, as I, I, I alluded to in the presentation, are going to be left behind. Uh, the world is moving east. Uh, I don't think any countries, least of all small island developing states, um, can afford to go west. Um, they, will, uh, they will be swept away <laughs> with the tide, or they will be pulled with the tide, hopefully. Um, but again, it depends on national circumstances. It depends on, on how you transition. But it requires, at the end of the day, um, that policy shift that says, we are going to do this, and it will be done according to what is practical for that economy. Um, but I don't think it's a case of, uh, of either or. I mean, look, India has indicated that in, by 2050, they will not be selling any new uh, liquid fuel vehicles. India, I mean, of all, of, of all countries that you would probably, who, who has, uh, and, and along with China, who have, of this huge appetite for, for fossil fuels, uh, traditionally, are now making the shift. Um, they, they, they have shifted, uh, I mean, they have spearheading uh, increased investments in renewable energy. So it all depends on what is practical um, for the economy, but again, has to be taken as a whole, and not necessarily siloed approaches uh, in terms of the whole national economic development paradigm that the country can afford. And that's why it's a transition and not a switch. Thank you very much, Mr. Kumar Singh, and thank you very much for your very engaging questions. Thank you. Thank you. I would now like to invite the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Mrs. Bridget Anissa George, to give some closing remarks. Thank you very much, Mistress of Ceremonies, colleagues. I really didn't intend to make any closing remarks, but having regard to the presentation that we've had by Mr. Kumar Singh, I feel compelled to say a few short words. While this topic was on the geopolitical responses of climate change, I think it ties up very aptly with some of the discussions we were having, in my view. Um, in one of our sessions, we dealt with parliamentary leadership and the role of presiding officers in promoting effective functioning parliamentary committees. And I think based on the presentation, it is quite clear that while the Paris Agreement, yes, talks about Parliament having a role, I think its presentation clarifies what our role would be in that in, as part of the whole um, requirement for our governments to achieve, achieve the Sustainable Development Goals and the Agenda by 20. 30, it means that we have to do oversight. And we could only do oversight effectively through 
our committee um, mechanisms. And um, therefore, it also ties into resources, which we also discussed, because if our um, governments are required to monitor, report, and verify before they go to the uh, global entity, we also have to have the capability to monitor. And therefore, in terms of resources, when we discussed even things about experts being available to committees as part of our leadership, I guess we have to start positioning ourselves in that. A very important question was asked by, if I'm not mistaken, the Speaker of Bahamas in terms of education. And again, ties back into a session we had, which we dealt with improving relations between parliaments and the society. And we too discussed engagement and therefore our role as engaging our citizens, our role in sort of um, the influences of civil society becomes again real in light of the presentation that was made to us. So while sometimes we get bogged down in the technical aspect of our business, practice and procedure, I think this is a real life example of what our core business is in terms of oversight, in terms of finding resources in very creative ways to ensure that oversight is effective and also in terms of our role of improving our relations with society, engagement of our citizens. We have a role to educate, we have a role to spread the message and therefore we have a responsibility for us ourselves to be informed. So I really think that um, this particular topic, as live as it is, and as Mr. Kumar Singh said, I believe it is the one universal environmental issue that should engage everybody because of its wide socio-economic impact. I think we've had a brilliant opportunity today to see how all that we've discussed before becomes live on a particular issue. So I want to say thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would now like to invite the Vice President of the Senate of the Assembly of Jamaica, uh, Mr. Senator Auburn Hill, to give the vote of thanks. Mr. Kumar Swing, it is indeed a pleasure to have had you give us such a wonderfully informed, broad in scope, and yet with significant details of something that is so topical and also so controversial. Moving from East, where I was in India a week ago, back to the West, and we know the ranges of opinions traveling that distance. You covered the subject very well. Thank you so much for informing legislators who have to deal with this issue and frankly, in my view, must step up much more so in the Caribbean where we have so much um, solar energy available to us, the biggest, as he told you, nuclear plant in the world shining most um, 
magnanimously on us in the Caribbean, where Germany leads in um, solar energy, and they have, you know, 10 days a year of really good sunshine in August, and England has two. And they're right there with, with Germany. We have to step up and uh, to, to take this and win. We're doing some in Jamaica, the country I live in. Others are doing uh, even faster given the size that they have. Mr. Kumar Swing brought this issue clearly to us this morning um, in a fashion that was timely, informative, and gave us reason to think and go back and legislate about. We have to legislate to say, look, for instance, if you're going to build a house of anything more than four uh, square meters, you're going to have to put on two renewables on it. Uh, renewable water, renewable energy. Whichever form you take, you can choose where you are, wind and, or solar, whatever else you use for renewable. But also say to the, the financiers, I'm a banker, financiers, you cannot put a mortgage on that house unless you finance the entire infrastructure for the two renewables that are required by law. So you must finance the labor, you must finance the equipment. Uh, generally, governments give equipment coming in uh, duty-free, but the financiers don't step up to the plate unless you make the legislation in place uh, for them to say you're obliged to do it. They're not going to do it. So legislators, Mr. Kumar Swing has, has challenged us all this morning. And for that, I want to say thank you so much. And on behalf of my colleagues from all these um, territories and countries, thank you so much for taking the time, for taking the, the, I know how much when you have to lecture for or give a seminar for 45 minutes, it's eight, nine hours, 10 hours of preparation to get there. You have done as well. We thank you greatly. And on behalf of my colleagues, very many thanks. Mr. Kumar Singh, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, and of course our audience via the Parliament's live stream on our PalView YouTube channel. Thank you very much for joining us for this lecture on the geopolitical response to climate change by Mr. Kishan Kumar Singh. Thank you so very much. <laughs>